Hi, welcome back everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about three weapons that changed the 21st century. Our, my sources are Freedom of American Scientist, uh, Eugene Saad and Adam Mount, both PhDs, wrote a great white paper on this um, topic and TASS News Service, that's the state-run news service out of Russia. Uh, so we took some uh, articles from them, some claims, and we're gonna verify them. Uh, Missilethreat.csis.org, uh, great website. Um, the Aviationist and H.I. Sutton, uh, all had great articles on this, these weapons. And the whole reason why I'm doing today's lecture is my new source, Anonymous, uh, sent me a lot of information that I find very interesting on these hypersonics. And I used the DARPA.mil website to kind of bring uh, images and photos to what he was uh, describing to me. So let's begin by talking about the least lethal or least capable and oldest uh, technology uh, weapon. This is the KH-47M2, the Kinzhal. NATO name is Killjoy. This is essentially an SS-26 short-range ballistic missile that's normally carried around on a truck that has been modified to be strapped to the bottom of a MiG-31 plane or a Tu-22M3 bomber and then carried aloft where it is then released from very high altitude, 50, 60,000 feet, and uh, letting the ballistic missile rocket you know, take it to its target from there. So uh, this is basically a old 1980s era short range ballistic missile that's been modified. So what are some of the limitations of this? Well, because it's on a, uh, an airplane that doesn't have very much stealth capability, uh, we can track the airplanes that hold these or have the potential of carrying these uh, greater than the missile itself. And if you destroy the airplane while it has the weapon on it, you destroy the weapon uh, there as well. Now, its range is estimated to be 2,000 kilometers, and that's assuming that the MiG-31 is carrying it, does not get aerial refueled, and uh, has enough fuel to return to base. Under all those circumstances, uh, this missile has a range of 2,000 kilometers. Obviously, with the Tu-22 bomber, that's even further, but keep in mind, these planes can, can refuel. Now, the boost phase of this rocket motor does exceed Mach 5. That's what makes it a hypersonic weapon. And it does peak around Mach 9, Mach 8, Mach 9. And uh, we did see this used in both the, uh, the Syrian war, at least the SS-26 was, and we saw this weapon used in the Ukraine war recently on top of all the testing that, that they've done. Like I said, this weapon's been around in some form or another since the 1980s. So we do know a lot about its performance. Um, now, whenever it's airdrop like this with the hypersonic um, you know, warhead on it, uh, it doesn't maintain hypersonic speeds during the entire travel, okay? So it does get up to a peak around the Mach 9, and then it falls down below Mach 5 as it, gets, uh, as it loses energy, as it gets closer to its target. So it does slow down to supersonic speeds. Um, now, maneuvering has been observed uh, in terms of course correction for this missile to keep it on target, implying that it has a fixed target uh, you know, before it's launched and it can't be retargeted in the air. Russia has claimed that this is also a radio control missile, but there's absolutely no evidence of that. The TASS claim, the news service out of Russia, claimed that this does have an optical sensor on the nose. And in all photos with the uh, missile being, you know, looking at the nose, there's no evidence that there's any sensor whatsoever in, in the nose. There's just, just big heat shield there. Uh, but again, they, they claim that they can radio control this missile in its terminal phase to make sure it hits the exact target. Um, there's no evidence that that's true whatsoever. Let's move on to the second missile because this one's a little more capable. And this is where we're starting to get a little bit scary. Okay, so winged hyper, uh, the Zarkon missile is a winged hypersonic cruise missile uh, that can go to Mach 9, just like the other one, but it sustains itself at Mach 9. It does this with a scramjet. A booster solid propellant rocket motor gets it up to above Mach 5. It then ejects the booster motor and the scramjet propulsion takes over. Scramjet propulsions have no moving parts. They just have a very um, specifically shaped engine well that air falls into and then they dump fuel in that, combusting it, uh, and then it uses the shock waves to propel itself forward. Pretty uh, interesting use of physics, but the theory has been around, and scramjets have been around for decades. That's not new. What is new is that they've been able to contain this uh, scramjet and keep it operational for about six or more minutes as it travels to its target at Mach 9. Uh, the scary thing about the Zarkon is that it is both ship and submarine launched. So the real capability here is this thing can come out of the water 
from a submarine just about anywhere in the world because Russian nuclear submarines have global capability and endurance and range. And so you could be six minutes from being hit by this missile no matter where you are if you're on the coastline of any world. Uh, it does have a 1,000 kilometer range, so it can reach inland quite a bit. Uh, they claim that it has, a Russia claims that it has a 1,500 kilometer range. We just haven't seen that test yet. Um, but it's likely that it is more than 1,000 kilometers. But so far, the Zarkon missile, uh, in all of its tests that we've observed, has only hit static targets, including targets at sea. Whenever it's hitting ships, those ships are anchored in place, and then they get hit by this missile. So it's likely that maybe that this missile doesn't have uh, all the homing capability that we, we, we thought it did. So we've observed over 10 flights. Uh, I think Anand said 17 flights, but you know, just more than 10. Uh, these were both shot from surface ships and submerged. And uh, evasion, which is one of the claims Russia has for this weapon, has not been observed. You know, it's just been launched straight line in the direction of the uh, of the target. It can course correct for like winds and stuff. So it does have some navigational capability of something. Uh, but in terms of homing in on a target, that hasn't been observed because everything it's shot so far has either been a static object or a ship anchored in place. All right, and finally, the third one that we want to talk about today is the Avangard. Avangard is Russia's hypersonic glide vehicle. This is the closest thing to what the United States is developing. Um, but theirs is already operational. All these weapons, by the way, are, are in operation today uh, by Russia, okay? Now, the Avangard is unique in that it is ICBM launched, and there's at least two different ICBMs that can launch this, which affects its performance range and all that. But we know that it can go at least 7,000 miles. And with the new um, ballistic missile that they just brought online, I believe the American name is Satan for the missile, uh, it can get up to you know, probably 10,000 uh, miles with that. But anyway, what's cool about this glide vehicle is that the ICBM gets it up into the upper atmosphere and releases it at over Mach 20. Um, they claim Mach 27, but that's just a Russian claim. So we asterisk that, but we can confirm it's greater than Mach 20. Um, they did three years of testing. Maneuverability was observed during the testing. This glide vehicle can change in all four, you know, directions, up, down, left, right, um, and variations of all those at the same time while it's going at these incredible speeds. But uh, physics being physics, every time it makes a maneuver, it does slow it down. There is no propulsion on the Avangard. So every maneuver it makes takes energy away from it. But keep in mind, when you're talking plus Mach 20, you have a lot of energy to spare and it can use that. So uh, it glides only to target, so there's no propulsion. And we know where six silo complexes, complexes being more than one silo, uh, are in Orenburg region. But because these can be launched from a ballistic missile, that means they can also be on a ballistic missile submarine. And that changes the game entirely because like the Zarkon missile, you can get a ballistic missile pushing one of these things out of any ocean in the world, not very far from its target if it wanted to be. But there is no evidence of any kind of homing capability. Uh, it appears that this weapon, like the Zarkon, knows exactly where it's going to end up before it's launched. So while it can dance on its way to the target, it can't really change its target in flight. All right, so other limitations are uh, it is ballistic missile launched, which means we can uh, determine where some of these missiles are. And we know of 31 silos across those six complexes we talked about in the Orenburg Oblast. That's right here. But because they can be put on ballistic missile submarines, uh, we, we won't know where, where those are. Uh, another limitation doesn't have any kind of retargeting capability. So the people launching these need to determine their target exactly where that target is before they launch. Again, the Russians claim that they can do all these things, but they, they haven't demonstrated that ability to, to us yet. And again, the range is determined by the ballistic missile that it's sitting on. Uh, we're just estimating greater than 7,000 uh, miles. And that's it, folks. Uh, that's the three weapons that changed the 21st century. They all belong to Russia. They're all operational. And there is no weapon right now that can shoot down a maneuvering hypersonic vehicle. It doesn't exist. We're working on it right now, desperately, but our timeline for getting a working prototype in the United States anyway is 2028. 
And uh, we'll see if we even have one by then. But right now, Russia has three weapons, all of them nuclear capable, that the world, no country in the world, has the ability to intercept or stop. That changes the calculation of mutually assured destruction to just assured destruction. There, the mutual is now gone, and Russia is holding three weapons that they can choose to employ globally at any time. Just something to consider, folks. All right, thanks for watching, everybody.